your host, Doreen Steenland, and today I want to welcome our guest, Dr. Lara Patrickman. So let's just dive in off your bio. Um, you mentioned transformative inquiry and mindfulness meditation. Can you bring us up to speed on those terms? So we're talking apples to apples here. Absolutely. And I want to make this a little bit personal and just include a little bit what my personal journey was with this. Yeah because hopefully every other people in the medical profession can relate. But I certainly, when I applied to medical school, right, I knew that this was such a beautiful calling, right? But I also thought that it was going to make me truly happy inside. I thought that I was going to get a kind of personality makeover. And at the end of my training, I would be, you know, kind and compassionate like Mother Teresa. I'd be super smart and curious, uh, like Mary Curie. The, yeah. And I also thought I would be charming and fun like Meg Ryan. And I had this <laughs> vision of myself, you know, and all I had to do was get into medical training and all of my anxiety and woes would go away. And I would be like personality, as I said, personality makeover. And, you know, during that training, we're told Delayed gratification is the way to go. So you'll be happy when. So you'll be happy when you get into medical school. You'll be happy when you finish medical school, you finish your internship because then you make a little bit of money. You'll be happy when you finish your internship because that's so hard. You go into residency and you're finally studying what you want. You'll be happy when you get into fellowship because you get even more credibility. And finally, once you get that job and you get settled into your family and you have your beautiful doctor life, that's when you'll be happy. And so you keep thinking, well, once the next step comes, once the next step comes, then I'll be happy. And once the big step, the light at the end of the tunnel happens, that's it. That's that's going to be heaven kind of thing. Yeah. And I really believed in that. And it was pretty surprising and pretty kind of an unhappy realization to notice that after all of my training and all of this work, I was actually less happy than I was before I started medical school. And my husband, who I'd met in medical school, um, was in the same kind of boat. Mm -hmm. And we had two kids at the time. Um, you know, family stuff started happening. My mother got sick. Um, you know, life was starting to really happen to us, two kind of high maintenance kids. And I was like, well, what gives? Why is it you can take two, you know, pretty good people with good values, hardworking, living kind of the the dream in a in a sense, and 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 make them so unbelievably anxious and depressed <laughs> doing something <laughs> they're supposed to love, right? Yeah. And I started to see, well, I'm not the only one. If you look at statistics for physicians and look at statistics for medical professionals in general, we don't do very well. Um, very high suicide rates, very high alcohol and drug abuse problems, yes. on and on. We know that. Yes. And so I said, well, what can I do? And um, at the time, you know, I would have liked to have just dropped everything and gone to India, but I had too many, I had too much <laughs> going on in my life. So I was like, what can I do now? And so I started looking actually at uh, studies that show that meditation can change the structure and function of your brain mm -hmm. in a way that you can uh, actually pick up by a, a functional MRI. Now, being a radiologist, I was like, whoa, well, that's a sign, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was very scientific. You know, my st stress relief uh, program uh, growing up in, in, in my background was, you know, a good run and then several gin and tonics. Like that's how we <laughs> stress in my family, you know? Yeah. And so this was all kind of woo woo and kind of crazy, um, but the science was there. And I started, so I started practicing for myself and really noticing some changes, just in, changes in like little moments of like, being able to kind of drop back into my true self, my true kind of personality, my true joy, appreciating my kids more, um, being able to stand my husband more, who I love dearly. And we've done super well now that we are on board with how the mind works. Um, and, and so that was really, really helpful. And at the time, um, I had a good friend who was working in the, in the Air Force. She was a colonel in the Air Force. And she asked me to start teaching this to her troops in um, at the Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque. And so I had the privilege of doing that for four years. And that just totally dropped me into practicing, teaching, and and really wanting to get that news out that we can do things for ourselves, you know, that can really help us and help our mental well-being. 
So that was the meditation part. Mm -hmm. And I still teach that. It's still a cornerstone of my practice. And I absolutely would tell anybody, if you're going to do one thing, start with that. And there's so many easy ways of doing that now. You know, when I started teaching, there was nothing. Now we've got apps, teachers, you know, there's so many um, wonderful opportunities to do that. And then the second part, really, this, this part I call transformative inquiry, was basically noticing that even if I was really practicing a lot and really finding so much joy, there were moments where I was still very, very reactive. Mm -hmm. So I literally would teach like a weekend retreat and come home and be like Miss Zen and just cool and happy, and <laughs> you know, and then my tween son would look at me cross-eyed and raise his, you know, do that eye rolling thing. And I was off to the races, you know? And so it's like, there's really still places that are, I'm just still super reactive and falling back into old patterns. And what can I do about that? And in mindfulness, they're like, you know, keep practicing, keep practicing. And I was like, I'm in a hurry, you know, I'm, I'm a busy professional. I want something a little bit more focused. Yeah. And I've done a bunch of therapy and that's very helpful. I absolutely, absolutely think that if that's what you're thinking of doing, do it. It, it helped me tremendously. But again, I wanted more of a practice. And so I started getting into understanding the nature of thought and how thoughts arise. As it turns out, we have many, many thoughts. We have somewhere between 60 and 80,000 thoughts. It's not exactly clear how many, but there's thousands and thousands. 90% yeah. of those are actually of no use to us whatsoever. 90% of those are created by a reactive mind that's trying to get itself out of discomfort. There aren't the thoughts that tell you, oh, that's how I'm going to manage that HR problem, or that's what I'm going to do with my kids after school, or that's how I'm going to do my taxes, or that's how I'm going to read this MRI. Those are great thoughts. We'll leave those alone. But yeah. once you start to really understand and get familiar with your thoughts, you really start to notice there's a whole bunch of those thoughts that are really unhelpful, very repetitive, yes. very like you know, annoying. <laughs> and I was like, what do I do with those thoughts? My thoughts about how my son doesn't respect me, my thoughts about how the world should be different are not serving me. And so I came across this process called the work. And this is a wonderful process. And it's so great because it's a lot of it's free. You just go to thework.com. And this woman, Byron Katie, had invented this methodology that basically says, if you're stressed, it's because you're believing in a thought that's not true. Hmm. That thought belongs on paper. And there's a series of questions that you use to question this thought so that you can kind of kind of put the screws to the thought, right? Yeah. Put those thoughts on trial. Are they really true, right? And that's the first question. So the first question is, is it true? Yes. So we're, I was going to ask you to facilitate me today just yeah. to show you that you don't need, I know you, you don't have a, a background in this. I've talked to you a little bit about it, but just to show you that you don't actually need a tremendous amount of background to do this. Um, and the results are pretty amazing. And it really, really transformed my mind and also gave me this tremendous confidence that if there's something that's bothering me, if I have a stressful thought, mm -hmm. by nature, it's untrue, which right there is helpful, right? Yes. <laughs> like yeah. right there, it gives you hope that you're like, yeah. oh, okay, okay. I, I know that. I don't have to believe everything I think. One of our biggest problems is we believe everything we think. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I, I want to stop us there for a minute because <laughs> yeah. um, I want to catch people up to speed on a few important things I want to highlight yes. that you said. The first thing that you said is that medicine programs us for delayed gratification to think future. I could be happy when. That's right. right. And so we're really not living in the present. That's right. All of the things that you talked about, the common denominator is that all of those 60, 70, 80,000 thoughts, however many there are, are either in the future or the past. Correct. The bulk of them are, say yeah, about that's, 90% of them are. That's pretty significant <laughs> considering that's we're right. living in this moment. That's right. <laughs> that's right. It's like, when you think of like, you know, government spending too much and like deficits and and like you know this is a big leaky hole i mean this is a place of tremendous possibility for improvement right yes. when all of these thoughts and not only are they past and future oriented yeah but they aren't true yes right yeah and so we end up spending a lot of our mental attention 
a lot of our mental energy yes. focused on, it's like focusing on a puzzle that there's no solution to. And like, if you give your computer a problem, there's no solution to, right? What happens? You get the little spinny guy yeah. and everything shuts down, right? That's what starts to happen to us. Mm. We get so overwhelmed with all of these thoughts that layer and layer and layer and layer and layer. We buy into all of it thinking because we're smart medical professionals that everything we think is true, right? Everybody's telling us we're smart. Yes. So, oh yeah, I got to believe everything I'm thinking. I got to believe my son doesn't respect me. I've got to believe my chairman is out to get me. I got to believe this. I got to believe that, believe that. And could there be some truth in it? Could there pl be a place of discernment? Absolutely. But the way we go about it, we get so ramped up that the, the level of thinking is very, very unhelpful. And if you notice the places you actually find that that real solution, you know, when you got that idea and you're like, yes. oh, got it. <laughs> you know, it doesn't feel stressful. It feels like, yes. yes. Typically, when I ask my when I ask my clients, where was it when you had that idea? They'll inevitably tell you something very present moment oriented. The shower. The shower. Right? That's the, shower. the best idea. <laughs> love the shower, right? Why do people love the shower? <laughs> Yeah. First of all, there's no phones in there, right? Yes. Yes. Which I hear they're making water phones just for that. Please don't go there. No, please. But the shower is this exercise in presence if you allow it to be. So many smells, the warmth, you yes. know, you're in the sensory world, you're in the present moment. They'll tell me when I'm driving. When you're driving, you have to be present because you have to watch out, you know? And I think that's why people really like these extreme sports because you have to be present. You have to see what's going on as if your life depended on it because yes. it does. Yes. And so absolutely being in that present moment in which the true self actually emerges is the optimal, optimal place to be. Mm -hmm. Now, my experience was though sometimes we get these thoughts that get so sticky that it's hard to leave them to come into the present moment. Sometimes we get so ramped up because we so believe in this particular thing mm. that we think if we don't think about the particular thing, we're going to get in trouble, that it's hard. It's hard to get back into that present moment. And in those places, that's where I really feel, see the benefit of this inquiry process of saying, okay, I'm really struggling to come back into the present moment when I consider my kid who doesn't respect me. Yeah. I'm really struggling to get in the present moment when I'm thinking about, you know, getting a mammogram in next week. Yes. I'm really struggling staying in the present moment when um, my chairman's going to give me my feedback tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And in those places, that's where inquiry can be super, super helpful because you start to put down those thoughts that are pulling you out of the present moment, putting them on paper. And seeing kind of what's behind them. Because if you start to notice, a lot of that stuff is not new, very repetitive, mm -hmm. very much informed by childhood, very much informed by our past, our gremlins, you yes. know? Yes. And so it becomes a place for tremendous self-discovery and insight mm. so that you can start to navigate with a lot less fear, yeah. a lot less kind of stickiness to these stressful ideas. Wow. So I love what you're saying to take these thoughts, right? And put them on paper because that really just makes them sentences. Really? They're just a hundred percent sentences. They're not attached to your identity. They're absolutely right. And so there has to be a way to separate this. And I love the process that you're going to guide us through and, and train us on today yeah. because it's so powerful and it's a tool that you can do all day long. That's right. To bring yourself back to That's the present. Right. And, and yes, and we'll start in just a moment. And, and for mm -hmm. me also, the really added value of that was when you start getting into that world of inquiry, you start meeting other people who practice inquiry, all of a sudden you're training, you're exchanging facilitations with them, you're asking them, is it true? And you start to realize there's no new stressful thoughts. Everybody's walking around with the same baggage. Everybody. Yes. I, I was like, oh, my son doesn't respect me. And then my facilitator's like, oh yeah, I did that one. You know, um, <laughs> I'm no, I don't think I'm good enough. And then my, my facilitator's like, oh, I did that one. You know, you, you recognize that all of these thoughts are recycled, 
everybody's got them, but we're pretending like we don't. Yeah. And, and they're fundamentally not our deepest truth. And that's why they hurt. Yes. Right. That's why they hurt because they actually go against our truest self, our truest nature, our truest intelligence. And, and maybe that's the gift. Maybe stress is the gift to tell us that we're off track with our thinking, you know? Yeah. And also just labeling stress that stress is telling me that I'm off with my thinking. All of a sudden stress doesn't become so bad anymore. You know, stress mm -hmm. becomes kind of my friend. It's telling me I'm off time to center. Yes. So it's, it's an indicator light. It's, that's right. It's an indicator light that's saying, slow down yep. and let's just think through this, right? That's let's right. write these sentences down. Let's, okay. let's get objective and pull ourselves back and not be sucked into the story. Because we're all story. telling stories all day <laughs> long right. in our minds. <laughs> it's scientific language. The problem is we get sucked into our stories. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the whole problem right there. There you go. The oh yeah. my goodness. All right. Go ahead. So wh where do you want to go next? Would you like to uh, actually play one of these out? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. And I've, I've been saving this one and and not actually asking for help with it because I'm like, we're, I'm going to do this with Doreen. But um I have sent you the four questions and the turnarounds of Byron Katie. And again, this is all on the work.com. Yeah. Um, and this is one process of inquiry. So I practice a new, a number of different ones, sure. but this is probably the most straightforward, the, the, the more, most user accessible. It's all online. She's so generous. Um, so, so that's the one we're going to do today. And, and basically there's four questions and you're going to tell us the four questions as we go along. Okay. And then once once we're done with that part, there's what's called turnarounds. We look at that sentence from a different perspective. We change the grammar around, and I'll explain it to that as we're going along. Okay. Kind of like trying on new realities and see, yes. if, see if they fit. Yes. Okay, so what what is the, the sentence you're telling yourself sentence. right now? Sure. So the situation was, so I just started this new job, yeah. and I'm a radiologist, and so I was in the reading room, and it wasn't clear to me how we did kind of lunch hour things mm -hmm. and this might sound to you like a petty problem but in my experience it's the petty problems that bring us down you know mm. but anyway so um so I got a call a personal call related to some healthcare issues and um I left the room without telling the other staff where I was going and I left the room kind of in a hurry because I was really concerned for this call. And I came back about 45 minutes later and we'll call him Dr. S. But when I came back, Dr. S kind of looked at me like kind of judgmentally. And I really felt like I'd messed up, mm -hmm. but I really felt like he, he judged me. So my sentence is going to be, um, Dr. S is judging me. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is it true? that Dr. S is judging you? That's question number one. Is it true? Is it number one? Yeah. So again, Doreen, and that's what I love about being with you. You're, there's so, you're such room for space. This is meditation. So I'm going to go in and see what see what comes to me, right? This is not my smarty, smarty medical school mind. Oh yeah, I know the answer to this. You know, this, <laughs> is, this is profound work yes. and slowing it down is was always been a struggle for me. Okay. So I'm going to take a minute. <clears throat> Yeah, he's judging me. Can you absolutely know that that's true? Question number two. Question number two. So it gives me a second chance, right? It's almost like when you're asking the jury beyond a shadow of a doubt, can you know this, right? So no, I can't know that. I don't know for sure. Hmm. Okay, so question number three would be, how do you react? And what happens when you believe the thought that he's judging you? Oh, so I kind of freeze. It's like the whole, everything stops. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this this sort of intense kind of sense of shame. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. and this is like collapsing. And at this point, I'm I'm actually sitting, we're, we're back, sort of back to back. He's across the room and I'm looking at my images and 
And I'm like, all of a sudden, like it feels the whole room kind of collapses inward. I'm, I'm not very connected with my imaging. I actually take a break because I'm like, I can't, I can't focus. And I feel this sort of familiar feeling of kind of like shame, like, oh, I did it wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and very quickly though, very quickly though, thoughts start to come like, you know, I, I clearly I'm giving an hour for lunch, you know, he should respect that. I didn't even take my full hour. You know, I get real defensive in my mind. And then I'm like, but then I'm like, God, can't you just communicate what's going on for you? Like, why can't you just tell them I've got this important phone call to take? What's your problem? So I start kind of berating myself. And then, and then I think, oh, he's so like, he's so well respected, this doctor. And oh, he does things so much better than me. And he's so great. And then, and then the next minute I'm like, well, what a jerk if he can't even, you know, <laughs> what? like, really? I mean, come on, you know? And and doesn't he know that I've, you know, having a health issue? I was having a bit of a health issue at the time. Doesn't he know? And, you know, if he just got his head up, as you know, like I start berating him too, yeah. right? It's so pretty, all this stuff, right? Yeah. So <laughs> thank you for letting world. us in your mind because this is real. This is real. <laughs> this is, okay. Oh, this happens. This happens. And it happens a lot. So that's, yeah, that's the thinking goes all haywire like that. And then I get sort of images of like messing up you know, doing it wrong. I get images. I actually get this weird image of my, of my fifth grade teacher. Um, Mm -hmm. She was so like, she was so like, oh, you know, Lara, you know, I was, I was a little, I was kind of a minority in my class and that I was the only English speaker in a French school. Um, And at the time it really made a difference too. And so I always felt kind of different and separate. And I all felt like she was kind of scolding me too much kind of on that basis. So that kind of whole story and spiel kind of came up. I'm different, I'm separate. Um, so that was, that's sort of the feeling that comes in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's just kind of a shit show. And then, and then, and then I just kind of, told myself, uh, just shake it off. It's not a big deal. And, you know, why do you make such a big deal about little things? And somehow was able to kind of get myself a little bit better to a better place where I could actually read again. I think I actually got up and there's a, there's a kind of a common area with treats. It was around Christmas time. So I think I ate like a big piece of Yule log, you know, <laughs> with the whole cake, you know, <laughs> Okay. it spoke to some people and kind of mustered my way back into kind of but it kind of stuck with me though yeah yeah so here's one of these questions that you're you're talking about how do you treat yourself and others when you believe that thought that's right that you're being judged yeah oh yeah so yeah get reactive um treat myself very well interestingly on the one hand there's the one voice that's saying you should be able to do you're a professional you should be able to go to lunch whenever you want you're this you know you're up here yeah. And then there's a part of me that's like, no, you're here. That's like, get it together, girl. Don't you have enough common sense even to be able to, you know, manage this relationship? Yeah. So there's this funny split, you know, that happens. And so that same split for him, you know, oh, he's the greatest thing or he's a, he's a jerk, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so that feels like what for you? What emotion? Oh yeah. That feels, um, it feels tight and constricted and shame. There's a lot of shame. This brings up a lot of shame for me. And I love how you connected it to your past because that's where it all comes from, right? It it might not be your teacher. It might be your mother. It might be something your father said. It might be a relationship that you were rejected in, right? And it brings up all of that stuff to the surface. Be judged, yeah. Yeah, So, so who would you be without this thought? Great. So that's question number four. Question number four. That's asking me to switch things around. And this takes some imagination, you know, especially when you're real stuck. You can mm-hmm. hardly even picture life without that. But as you get the more mindful, and this is where the meditation practice comes in, as you get more, frankly, if you get a little bit more control over what's going on in your mind. And control, people have a struggle with that word, but really is what you have more ability to be with your thoughts. Yeah. It's easier to kind of sit and say, okay, what would that situation look like if I just didn't have the thought he's judging me, right? Nothing's changed. He has the same look, yes. same look on his face. I'm not asking for a different reality. I'm asking for a different interpretation. And you can't control his look, right? Mm-hmm. 
So right mm-hmm. there, that's a thought that we can have. 100%. Right? Like, yeah. I can't control someone else's thoughts. I can't control their looks and I can't control no. their behavior. No. So what can I control? What's happening in here? hundred percent, a hundred percent. So now who would you be without that? Thought? That, that thought. Yeah. Okay. So give me a sec. Cause I'm pretty wrapped up in that way of thinking. Yes. I you know, like went back there. Um, hmm. Hmm. The first thing I noticed is that he had a tough morning. So in radiology, if our computers aren't working, we're dead in the water. And he was having a bunch of IT issues. We had the IT guys up there. So he wasn't able to read very much that morning. Um, I actually read most of the studies because his computer wasn't working. And so he was annoyed. Like he was really annoyed. This is a very conscientious guy. And like, this didn't go well. And it was, it seemed, I can see that this wasn't the first time the computers were problematic, you know, so it was like annoyed. So uh, already there's some sort of softening towards him. Um, without the thought, I'm really glad I was able to take that phone call. It was actually good news. Um, and I have sort of some compassion for myself for the place I was in that would have just pulled me out of that room. You know, like it wasn't business as usual. This was a very important phone call. And I can sort of see that like, okay, that phone call's done. I wasn't looking forward to it. It's done. <sighs> you know, I can kind of stay with that sense that I had after that. And then without the thought, he's judging me. Yeah, I look at the list, you know, and one of the things he'd said when I came back was like, oh, the list is really long. And so I open the list and I see that's how many studies we have to read. Yeah. And so I see it. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a longish list from, from where my other job, that was a small list. So I was like, okay, <laughs> glad that that's considered a long list here. Right. So I'm just more um, present. I'm just more present. I'm focused. Right. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm did my lunch, ready to work. You know, I've got that piece of my life away, like not away, but done tucked away. Now I can focus. Now I can really be of help. I also noticed I worked really hard all morning, you know, got to work on time, you know, things are going well by all means, you know, people are happy to see me and, and like, this is a good thing, you know? Um, And I think also without the thought, I can kind of be with a part of me that wants to, that wants to kind of be better about telling people what I'm doing. Cause I sometimes I know that I'm not always great. You know, I sort of assume people know what's going on for me. And so I think, I think I can kind of address that and kind of say, you know, Dr. S, I apologize for just taking off and not coordinating with you what time you wanted to take lunch. And I was going to take lunch because I had this phone call and I recognized that I didn't check in and I'd like to check in with you to see what you, when you want to go. And I think I would have been able to do that. I think I would have been able to kind of fess up to a little bit of unmindfulness in that situation without beating myself up too much and just being open about it and saying, listen, you know, I, I'm sorry, you know, I, I just had this call and I really want to coordinate things with you and please, you know, please take as much time as you want. Now I got it covered, you know? So I was, I'd be able to say that I wouldn't be so full of shame that I'd be able to say, listen, I messed up a little bit, yeah. you know, have a great lunch, you know, kind of thing. So, so yeah, I'm sort of back to my usual connected self. I'm thrilled to be working with this guy. He's amazing. You know, super smart yeah. and uh, just, just so happy, you know, just to be in that room and of service. Awesome. So I yeah. want to point out a few things that I noticed listening to you. I noticed that, that um, really when you started telling me the other details about his computer being down and it sounds like most of this was his own problem inside. Right. And then you took that to mean that's right something that's right. about you 100 percent. that was not true 100%. and it was yep. driving all of your thoughts and it made you shrink away that's right instead of standing 100%. up in your power and how often does that happen i mean yeah every other human we're interacting with is also having 60 to seventy thousand thoughts yes. they're also having computer problems they're also having problems with their kids they're also fed up with healthcare. you know yeah it's and it's I nice also noticed that, that um, you, you took responsibility yeah. 
for, for your gap in that relationship. And that's huge, right? When we can say, all right, you know, I did just leave abruptly. I can understand why he might've been confused or whatever he was. And I don't yeah. need to even know what he was, that's right? but I need to know what I need to handle for myself going that's exactly forward. Right. That's exactly right. And I'll tell you, and just as an aside, when I was, um, before I kind of got into this, I was talking to a family therapist about how to be the best parent possible. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you want to be a wall with a smile on it. And mm -hmm. I was like, I'm the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big gaping fenestrated wall with like, <laughs> with like a really face on it. And, and these kinds of tools allows us to take what's really ours in the situation. So when I'm chock full of shame, I can't take responsibility for my stuff, yes. right? When I'm chock full of anger towards my kiddos, I can't have good boundaries and I can't have be the smile. I'm the opposite. I get really angry with them. And then I feel so guilty that I indulge them, you know? Wow. And that's kind of what we do with ourselves, you know, yeah, because so, your brain is always trying to prove yourself right. Exactly. It's trying to keep you safe and prove yourself right. So if exactly. somebody, if you feel a certain way, you you're feeling attacked. That's right. And it's threatening. That's right. So your brain is just doing its job. That's we right. need to take charge of, of what's happening inside the brain. And what I love about your work is you're so clear. The first thing you need to do is to get yourself out of the sympathetic nervous system. Yes. You need to get yourself out of the adrenaline cortisol thing. Yes. That's where breathing, mindfulness yes. comes in and and then and then kind of assess. But as long as I'm believing that he's judging me, he's judging me, he's judging me, it's very hard to get out of that out of that monkey mind, lizard brain, you know? Yes. So good. Yeah. yeah. So good. Well, I, I could sit here and talk with you for hours, but yeah. I've promised our people that we would go for 30 minutes. And I think, I think we broke that promise. Oh, do we have but time for one turnaround? Yes. Do we have time for one turnaround? One turnaround. Okay. One so turn the sentence is, he's judging me. Yes. So the turnaround would be, I'm judging me. Ooh. How is that true? Right? I already illustrated all the ways I was judging myself making this about my fifth grade teacher, feeling the shame, doing all this. Other turnaround, I'm judging him, right? I'm taking a bad look and making it that this guy's the worst thing ever. That feels bad, right? And then the other turnaround is, he's not judging me. Well, wow. how could that be true? Wow. So those are further questions to kind of ponder and get some clarity of actually what's working, what's actually really happening. What's really happening is I'm judging myself. That's really the problem. Yes. Right. The good news is, though, that that's something I can control. Yes, that's something I can control. I can't control if other people are going to judge me, but I can control if I can judge myself. And frankly, when I stop judging myself, life gets a lot better. You're not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, boy. Are you not kidding there? That is like we are our worst enemies. At worst, times. Enemies. worst enemies. If we can stop the world from judging us or stop us from judging us. Yeah. You know, like so much of this drama is all uh, in between our ears. I'd and, say all of it, all yeah, of it. Yeah. yeah. And look, we're not denying that there's not real problems in medicine. Oh, there's not real that. stuff that needs to be deal, dealt with. That's not what we're saying here. No, what we're saying no. here is you can take charge of what's your responsibility to right. take charge of. And that this, this space is all you have charge of. That's right. <laughs> Because if I'm clear, even if he is judging me, it doesn't it doesn't have that bite to it. The bite is my judgment of myself. Yes. Could be he'll judge me the rest of his life. Some people do, right? Yes. Could be. But if I'm clear, it, it won't bother me. It just won't bother me. So you, know? you will have peace inside, even if he is judging you. That's right. Because you're not absorbing his shame. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No one can hurt me. That's my job. That's what Katie yes. likes to say right so good